the context, you were mid-20s, and I had just gotten, I just started as a rookie professor two years before. Um, so Bill, at the time, was uh, trying to set up a, an interesting um, business, which ultimately became Gotham Partners. Um, so for those of you who are students, as a 20-something-year-old, as a Bill set up his first hedge fund. Um, so why did you set up Gotham, Bill? And what did you learn from that experience? Uh, experience is making mistakes and learning from them. So that's what I learned. Um, no, so so uh, the answer is um, I went to business school to learn how to be a good investor. And I learned the first rule of investing, which is you do your due diligence before you wire in your, your money. And uh, when I got to HBS, I actually opened the course catalog for the first time, and there wasn't a class on investing. Now, there were classes on accounting. There were classes on finance. So I decided I had to develop my own little self-study program. And I wanted to, uh, so I, I opened a Fidelity brokerage account. I said this, I had some money I'd made in the real estate brokerage business. This was my tuition uh, in the investment business. And it was about a year of tuition. And if I lost it, it was as if I had gone to business school for two, you know, two years, but paid for three. So I, I figured it wasn't, it's like the, the inverse of the Oxford uh, one plus one program. But, um, and uh, you know, I, I, the first stock I bought went up. And then I said, okay, I found what I want to do. <laughs> a little more involved than that, but I, I uh, actually, my father, who's here, he, he, he came with us. Uh, that's dad over there in the corner. Uh, you can ask him whatever questions you want afterward. Um, he told me it was a really dumb idea to start an investment fund right out of business school, and he recommended that I go work for Michael Steinhardt or you know, George Soros or one of the other famous investors at the time, but I figured that I knew enough. You know, this is the, the, the perils of youth. Um, but. Uh, the answer is I was an entrepreneur, and uh, I felt that I wanted to approach investing my own way as opposed to uh, learn from someone else. And it's one of the few things you can really learn on your own. You can learn investing by reading books, by reading annual reports, by having a, you can have a portfolio and invest $100, and you can, and you can learn the business, uh, unlike many other businesses which require a lot more. Uh, at least that's what I thought at the time. So you went far away from just investing in fidelity type you know, on, on, a, on a brokerage platform. Um, and Pershing Square has a particular form of investing, which some of our members of the audience may not understand, and it's sometimes called activist investing. So maybe you can just help, you know, orient the audience about what exactly does Pershing Square Capital do? What's the general investment style? And, and why did you set it up that way? Um, so the vast majority of capital invested in the markets today is passive. So if you think of index funds or ETFs or even the big uh, kind of long-only institutions, the vast majority of that capital is by charter passive. Passive means you, you do your research, or in some cases you don't do the research. You sort of just blindly follow an index and you're, you're judged based on how closely you follow the index. If you think about investing 100 years ago, though, investing, you had Andrew Carnegie owning 20% of U.S. Steel or you had J.P. Morgan as a, as a large owner of various companies over time. And in the old days of investing, an owner would act like an owner. So if they were unhappy with the performance of the business, they would replace the CEO. If they were unhappy with the board's judgment, they would make changes to the board. And as capitalism sort of democratized the investment process, and as any kid in business school can open a brokerage account, and as uh, it's, you know, the, uh, the owners of many of these great uh, businesses over time you know, gave the shares away to a university or their heirs and the ownership was dis, you know, spread out, you know, the Sam Waltons of the world uh, kind of passed away and the boards became to be managed by uh, professional owners. And so uh, what we do is we look for situations where a business has lost its way, uh, where an otherwise great company or in, a, in a business that we would define as one that has significant barriers to entry, that Warren Buffett would describe as having a moat around it, a business that is simple, predictable, generates cash, and we can be confident we'll be here 50 years from now. A good example is we own a stake in Canadian Pacific, which is a, a railroad in Canada. Um, and if you think about the railroad business, you know it's not—it's a business where they're not going to build a new one across the street. You, know, you can have, you know, absent some fairly dramatic changes in technology, you can be pretty comfortable that you know, goods will be shipped on rail for a very long time to come. So we, it's a business we can predict. We can think about it from a very long-term perspective. We can buy it at a price that's interesting. And in the case of CP, uh, this was the worst-run railroad in North America. It had the lowest profit margins. It was trading at the lowest valuation relative to earnings and had a very unhappy shareholder base, but there was nothing they could do about it because they were inherently, again, the, the biggest investors tend to be very passive. And we saw an opportunity, and the opportunity was if you could replace the worst CEO in, in uh, the railroad industry with the best CEO in the railroad industry, a lot of money 
could be made. And we bought uh, first 12% of the stock and then another 2%, so about 14% of the stock. We recruited a guy named Hunter Harrison, who is uh, widely considered the best railroad executive of all time, you know, certainly in North America. He had retired at 65. He was 66 and a half. He had signed a two-year non-compete with his employer, and I think the biggest mistake they made was a two-year non-compete, because he was running the, uh, the other Canadian railroad, Canadian National. And uh, we hired him as a consultant. He helped us study the railroad, and he had plenty of fire in his belly. And we said, look, would you be interested in a day job? And he said, let me check with my wife. And she said, you know what? It's time to get you out of the house again. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, we recruited him, and then we had to simply put him in place. Now, the problem was Canadian Pacific has one of the most sort of esteemed and illustrious boards in Canada, at least at the time, and it was the former head of the Royal Bank of Canada, the former CEO of Suncor Energy, the former head of the steel business. You know, it was a very, very important board, and um, they didn't like the idea that this idea was coming from outside the company, so they said no. Um, so we went to the shareholders and we ran an election, you know, a proxy contest. We put up seven directors for uh, seven seats on a 13-seat board. Uh, and the shareholders voted with us 90% uh, of the time and voted against the other guys. Uh, and they got between 3 and 11% of the vote. We put our directors on. Uh, we did a review of the best CEOs in the world. Turns out the guy we identified was the best guy. Uh, we put him in a CEO, and that was 16 months ago. Uh, and it's almost the most profitable railroad in North America after 16 months. That's how quick this guy goes to work. Stock's gone from 46 uh, to $151 a share. It's, you know, a little under $8 billion market cap to a $25 billion market cap. And that's kind of the perfect example. Now, it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> and I have a feeling that Peter might ask me about one of those cases. <laughs>